uh, Stanford's 10th president. And welcome to a wonderful day for the university. This is a wonderful day not only for Stanford, for our medical school, and for our faculty, but in particular, of course, congratulations to our colleague, Stanford's newest Nobel laureate, Brian. <laughs> He is a professor and chair of molecular and cellular physiology, and you'll hear from him shortly. I'd also like to extend our congratulations to his co-winner, Professor Robert Lefkowitz of Duke University, uh, with whom Professor Kolbika sh shares this prestigious honor. It was a set of collaborations earlier in their careers that started them on this remarkable journey, something I'm sure Brian will want to talk about. Now, it's, we're holding this in the Paul Berg uh, conference room, which I think is really auspicious. Uh, as you know, Paul won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1980. Um, and just a few years ago, uh, Andy Fire and Arthur Kornberg won for Medicine and Chemistry, respectively. So today marks our 27th Nobel, and it is both humble and gratifying a tradition of excellence in our research and what our faculty have been able to do. Like many discoveries, this work that, award, that won the Nobel has evolved over many years. It was here at, at Stanford that Professor Koblika was able to build upon the work that helped us understand how human cells read their environment and sense it through mechanisms called G-protein coupled receptors. And I have to admit that since I take a medicine that uses the G-coupled protein receptor, I'm a beneficiary of this discovery. Many in the scientific community thought that his work might be an unattainable goal. But he managed to achieve it through hard work, diligence, and over many years with a eureka-like moment that occurred during his discovery. And I'm sure he'll share that with you. The Stanford's long-term commitment to basic science dates back many years when the medical school was moved from San Francisco to here. And in fact, Professor Berg was one of the first members of that newly formed basic science departments in those early days. Uh, today, it is the incredible commitment of our faculty researchers um, that a lifetime of dedication to science and discovery that really ensures that we remain in the forefront of scientific discovery and the excitement which we all share today. I speak for the entire Stanford community regarding the pride we have in our medical school, of course in Brian's achievement, and our faculty on this day. I'd now like to turn the program over to Professor Pizzo. Thank you. Well, thank you, President Tennessee. Of course, it's a great privilege and honor to congratulate Brian Kobilka for this extraordinary honor today. Uh, this is a landmark moment. Uh, it is interesting to note that just a week ago, we sat in Paul Berg Hall with three Nobel laureates on this dais celebrating the importance of basic science research. And uh, as I scanned the room and looked through the faculty were there, I noted Brian and wishfully hoped that we'd be here at some point, not knowing that this would be the day exactly. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful accomplishment. Uh, as you know, uh, Brian comes to this journey with just dogged dedication. Uh, he began at the University of Minnesota. He went to the Yale University School of Medicine and actually went to St. Louis, Barnes Hospital, did his residency in internal medicine and then made the fundamental decision that to improve life, he would dedicate his career to research and to probing some of the basic mysteries of life. And uh, fortuitously, he went to Duke worked with Bob Lefkowitz, with whom he now shares this great honor, and unraveled um, some of the most complex uh, mysteries that he'll share with you. It was a real tour de force, and it speaks to several things, endurance, brilliance, dedication, commitment, um, to uh, assailing the odds because you really passionately believe in something. And I think it also speaks to a person uh, Everyone in this room who knows Brian, uh, I think, shares in just great admiration of what a wonderfully kind, generous, humble, thoughtful, and uh, courageous person he is. It's a great privilege for us to celebrate this moment with you, Brian, because you epitomize what's really great about science, and in particular, the 
dedication of the individual. In this era of big science, you speak um, to the era that really lets ideas mature and find their way into reality. Congratulations, Brian. So um, thank you, uh, President Hennessy and, and Dean Pizzo for those kind words. And uh, uh, as some of you know, I'm not very comfortable um, in doing this. Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, I'm really fortunate to have uh, worked with uh, my co-awardee, Professor Lefkowitz, Bob Lefkowitz, and uh, to start me on this journey. Uh, I, I also want to say that I really have been fortunate to have my wife is uh, as someone who's worked with me on this journey since um, since those days in, in at Duke and continues to the present. Uh, Stanford has been a really remarkable place. Uh, I'm not really sure how I managed to land here, but I, I did. And uh, as I was telling someone this morning, I think it was the only place that offered me a job. <laughs> <laughs> foresight, foresight. <laughs> and uh, so, I, you know, being here, um, you can have uh, ideas which other people might think are crazy and, and, and probably you're not qualified to do, but people at Stanford will try to help you do them. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the collaborations that I formed really early on was with Bill Weiss in structural biology, who, uh, uh, who used to, I remember uh, early days when I would get, uh, get crystals of salt or detergent and he would come down and try to look at them and, and let me down gently. Um, so I, I appreciate that. And, uh, and, and you know, being at Stanford, you, you attract really fantastic um, colleagues and, and students and postdocs. Uh, and, it, it, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've thought, uh, you know, how am I going to hide the fact that I know this kid is smarter than I am? And, and, and try to make him think that I know something. But, uh, so it's, uh, you know, I don't really know what else to say. It's been, a, uh, it's been a very big surprise. And I also want to point out that, you know, this, this work that I've been cited for is, is uh, in, in large part an a, a incredible collaborative effort. Uh, it started uh, a number of years ago with uh, a, a collaboration with Roger Sinhara at University of Michigan, who's um, been a long uh, time friend and collaborator as well, and it involved a, a number of people, uh, uh, collaborations of, with people from Ireland, from Belgium, from um, you know across the United States, and, and, uh, and a number of really talented postdocs. And I, I also want to point out uh, a really brave postdoc, uh, uh, Soren Rasmussen, who took on the project uh, together with Brian DeVry in, in uh, Roger Sinhara's lab. So I just want to, you know, this, this, was a, this was a team effort, and, and I, I certainly want to acknowledge those people as well. So didn't, I'm not sure what else to say. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> we've, we've got... We've got the opportunity for questions. Uh, if you're from a news organization, please identify yourself. Uh, we'll do this uh, probably with a hard stop at 1030. Duke is doing their announcement at 1030. Uh, so, Lisa? Uh, yes, if you could explain what you did and why it matters. <laughs> 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 Joseph, I study uh, a family of proteins that are important in uh, transmitting information from one part of the body to the other. So uh, we, our bodies are really complex uh, clusters of, of specified cells uh, that are clustered into tissues and organs, and uh, they have to work in coordination with each other. And you know, your brain is on the top, and, and you have muscles and organs that are either in the midway or all the way in the bottom, and, and there has to be information transfer. And that, that occurs by uh, some cells releasing small molecules that either get circulated or released in nerve terminals and then are detected by other cells. And the way they're detected is by receptors. And the large majority of those receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. So there, uh, you're probably familiar with um, terms like adrenaline, dopamine, uh, serotonin, histamine. Uh, 
all of these compounds are, are detected by G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, we see uh, using G-protein coupled receptors. We perceive odors using G-protein coupled receptors. So they're, they're important proteins that transfer information from outside of the cell, inside the cell. And uh, we've been very interested in understanding how they work just because they're, they're, they're so interesting and important. And also they're, they're really important targets for, uh, for potential therapeutics. For existing drugs, I, I've, been, I've heard that the number is around 40 to 50 percent of, of current pharmaceuticals work on G-protein coupled receptors. But there are, you know, there are potential for other G-protein coupled receptors to, to be used therapeutically. And, and so they've been important targets for drug discovery. So the work that was done at Duke, uh, when I joined the lab, we didn't really have any idea what these proteins looked like. Uh, the, the Lefkowitz group had, uh, had made major strides in, um, in characterizing them using other tools, uh, but we, 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 didn't, we didn't have the DNA sequence or the protein sequence. And, uh, and while I was there, one of my colleagues, Jeff Benevic, uh, succeeded in purifying uh, a small amount of this protein from, I believe it was hamster lungs. And, uh, and then after purifying this protein, he chopped it up into bits with proteases and got some sequence, uh, a couple peptides sequenced. And from that sequence, we were able to pull out the genomic sequence from a genomic library. And from that genomic sequence, we could deduce the, the amino acid sequence from the protein. So that was the first uh, first time we really had an idea that there were seven transmembranes, and, and in fact, we were surprised that it looked so much like rhodopsin. Uh, in retrospect, we should have understood that that's what it would look like, but it was a surprise at the time. And that was all done at Duke? That was all done at Duke, yeah. Uh, and then what, what I've done here at Stanford is try to convert that, um, that linear sequence of amino acids into a three-dimensional picture. Uh, using uh, X-ray crystallography. In the back. Uh, I guess I, I wasn't exactly sure if it was real to begin with, and I think everybody has that response, but. Um, uh, I was extremely happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not more eloquent, but <laughs> uh, that's okay. In the science community, this is called going to Stockholm. <laughs> there was a reference made to a eureka moment. Yes, so the eureka moment uh, for. I think that the, the, there've probably been a couple of eureka moments in, in, in my career, but the, the one that is that stands out above all others is the seeing for the first time uh, a, a G-protein coupled receptor in the act of actually signaling. And this was a crystal structure that was reported last year. And uh, um, when when we actually saw that, it was it was just uh, amazing and, and so exciting. Um, <laughs> that's hard to describe. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, well. So the, what's really interesting and neat about it is you have a, a plasma membrane, and then you have our receptor, which has seven transmembranes, and this little molecule is stuck on the top, which is representing a hormone, and it's activating this very large molecule on the inside of the cell. So it's you know how how something small can be perceived by this really interesting receptor and transmit that information to, to a cellular protein that then goes on to turn on or regulate a, a large number of other proteins in the cell. So it was, it was very exciting. invested in, in continuing your research, what's, what's going to happen next? Well, we have several um, lines of research. One is uh, what we've discovered we think is representative of, of probably the largest, the large number of G-protein coupled receptors. But I think you, you have to, we have to go back and make sure that it's, it is representative. So one of the 
the projects we've, over the past couple of years, we've isolated a number of other G protein coupler receptor uh, structures. So one is a muscarinic receptor and, and opiate receptors. And, and we'd like to get uh, structures of those receptors with their G proteins, which are, which are a different uh, type of G protein than the one we've got. So some of that is, you, you might say it's cleanup work, but it's still very challenging cleanup work. And, and, and we need to know, we hope to learn from that how certain receptors selectively activate one G protein over another. Another area of research that um, we've just submitted a grant in, and, and I hope that we, we will get funded, is, uh, <laughs> is, is to try to take uh, what we're learning about receptor structure um, and, and develop structure-based approaches for drug discovery. So try to take our, our discoveries and, and facilitate drug discovery uh, using these approaches. Now, this has been done for soluble proteins, but it's still a very big challenge for, for these, these receptors. Um, and then the third area is to, uh, it's a collaboration with Dr. Lefkowitz uh, and others uh, to try to understand uh, how receptors activate a non-G protein uh, pathway, which is the arrestin pathway. So those are still fairly, there's a fair amount of work to do. Any words to the young researchers and young students? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, first I'd have to say that this is a fantastic uh, way to spend your life uh, in science. And uh, it's, it's hard, but if, if you're interested in it and you persevere, I, I think you can be successful. And it's always, um, every day is, is a challenge and, and exciting. And, uh, and, and certainly, as you go from being that young scientist to an old scientist, um, you, you, you're surrounded by young people with great ideas and, and enthusiasm and energy. Uh, so you still feel young, even as you age. <laughs> we call that the vampire effect, you see. So. <laughs> Lisa? It seems as though you pull from several different fields in your research. Can you talk about the importance of interdisciplinary this, this was a very much an interdisciplinary project, and uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, uh, the efforts, we originally didn't realize how important uh, they would be. Uh, I, my favorite one is, to, to give an example, uh, we, were, we had succeeded in, in making a very nice preparation of our protein, and by all criteria, it should have crystallized, and it just wasn't. Uh, we then sent some protein to uh, Yergo uh, Skidniotis, who's a young uh, faculty member at, at Michigan, who's an expert in, in electron microscopy. Now, our protein is, is much too small to actually get a structure by electron microscopy, but we just wanted him to tell us what it looked like. You know, was it you know, all aggregated or was it nicely behaved? He told us it behaved very nicely, and then he started looking very carefully, and even though everybody would have told him that it's not worth trying to go further. He did. He went further, and, and he was able to, in fact, get some structural information from it. And he told us why he thought, you know, he provided some information to us that suggested f other ways that we might approach this and problems that we needed to solve. So that was, uh, you know, that was very useful. Um, another uh, approach that became very important is uh, 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 a type of an antibody that is produced by camelids, so they, they make a special kind of antibody. They're called nanobodies, uh, and, and we took advantage of that uh, through a collaboration with Jan Steert in Belgium. Uh, the other uh, really important part of this was um, a, a, a collaboration with uh, Sam Gelman early on who helped us develop some special detergents. These, these membrane proteins have to be pulled out of the membrane with uh, soap-like molecules, and uh, working with uh, pill soap and, and Sam Gelman, we developed a couple of detergents that uh, particularly uh, afforded great stability to the complex. And, and then finally, we crystallized this in, in a lipid environment, and that lipid was a special lipid produced by uh, Martin Caffrey in, in Dublin. And uh, I'm, I'm probably leaving out some other really important, uh, but it was, you can imagine. And, and there, were, there, were, there were always people who were willing to to try something even though they knew that most likely it wouldn't work. Here at Stanford, did you tap into any of the multiples and the other disciplines? 
again, I'm, I'm really nervous that I'm missing somebody. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I always Bill Weiss, who's, you know, provides uh, uh, you know, great advice about crystallography and data collection and processing. Brian, there are, excuse me, there are two points in your career that are <coughs> juncture points. One of them was when you decided, um, after doing your residency, to join the lab of Bob Lefkowitz and not pursue clinical medicine. I think, tell us a little bit about that decision. And then the second, which is really so central to everything you've done, how did you keep going um, when everyone kept saying or the data kept saying, this is really hard? What was it that kept your resolve in place? Well, uh, so the first question is, when did I decide that I wouldn't be a cardiologist? Um, so I, I went to Duke with the, to, and joined the cardiology program, but they had the opportunity to start doing research first. And, and so I started in the lab, and pretty much I just fell in love with the, the process and, and the people. And, um, and clinical medicine is, it was, it was very interesting as well, but it's very different in, in, in this respect. And... Uh, <clears throat> I never, I, I, I had to do some clinical work. Uh, I, I decided after about two years that I, I really didn't want to be a cardiologist. Uh, but I was forced by my obligation to, to do uh, the intensive care unit. So uh, I made a lot of people there very nervous because I, <laughs> I came to the intensive care unit after two years of, in the lab. And, uh, but, and, and I did enjoy it, but I, I really decided at the point that I wanted to primarily do research. And, uh, and it was... It was not a decision that I made all at once. Um, I think, like everybody who has the option to do clinical work, you kind of hold on to it because you're afraid you might fail in research. Mm. So I have to admit that. And I think we, we, hope, we try to keep, keep our skills uh, long enough. But um, I, I, I did. I, I can confess this to Dr. Pizzo uh, right now because I, I, I I continued to do my clinical work while I was here uh, by moonlighting on weekends to, 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 to pay the mortgage. Um, but, uh, Me too. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in, 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 you know, I, I gradually decided that you know, once you do, do it, you're not doing it enough, often enough you feel that you're not as competent as you should be, so then you just quit. Um, the other question is about the pursuit despite uh, the adversity. So uh, the, the, the answer to that uh, came from a, a colleague, uh, a fellow uh, left school lab person, uh, uh, Henrik Dolman, who's now a professor at U UNC in North Carolina. And he described it as irrational optimism mm -hmm. uh, in that um, you always think, even though something fails, you'll go home and at the end of the day you'll be a little down. And then you think of an idea and it's, mm. oh, this one's going to work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you keep just thinking that something's going to work. Yeah, that's great. Professor Jason Benner, KLI Radio. Can you compare uh, Duke and Stanford, the facilities, the atmosphere? <laughs> <laughs> Does it come here for the weather, or is there something about Stanford? Should you comment on the football team? <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at Duke, uh, it, it was... It, I was primarily in one very large lab. Uh, the Lefkowitz lab was a very well-funded, relatively large lab. And, uh, and there aren't very many large labs of that size anyway here. Uh, and, and everything, everything was self-contained in that lab. We rarely had to go out for any, uh, any other expertise. At Stanford, uh, the, the, the groups are smaller. But what's particularly interesting about Stanford is that that the medical school campus and the undergraduate sciences are all together. So in one very small geographic area, you can you know, cross the street and, and talk to someone in physics or chemistry or uh, engineering. And, and that, that was really, uh, I think, very helpful. I, I remember early on, I, I had some problems. I need some chemistry expertise. And I just walked to the chemistry department and started knocking on doors and asking who would know how to do this. And mm -hmm. I came away with an answer. Well, okay, that specific problem um, that I was having uh, at the time was to try to make a, a, a reagent that helped us to purify our protein. 
And I, I knew in principle how to do it, but I didn't actually know all the details. And, and so it, it, I really did. I had no idea who over there could help me, but it was easy just to walk over there and find out. Um, I've, you know, I've spent time talking to Dr. Morner on a number of occasions about some, some crazy ideas that, and he, you know, he would uh, entertain some experiments and, and, and give it a try, and uh, Dr. Zayer, and uh, um, so, yeah, and I would say, you know, many of these uh, efforts fail, uh, but they're still, you know, you learn from them, and, and, uh, and I think students and postdocs learn from them. Even, even sometimes things fail, they can be uh, useful educational experiences. We have time for one more. Or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. <laughs>